Hello, everybody, and thank you to um, everybody who's joined us this evening. This is um, our second Twitter space this evening, but we thought it was really important to do this one um, to have a conversation about frontal temporal dementia, obviously in light of the recent um, diagnosis that Bruce Willis and, and his family have shared, and lots and lots of questions circulating around about what is frontal temporal dementia, what does it look like, how does it affect people, and, and what supports available. So we wanted to come along and, and have this conversation to share some of this information with you. And I'm absolutely delighted that I've got some excellent guest speakers this evening. So I'm joined by Hannah Gardner, by Jules Knight, and also by Lizzie, who I'm going to ask them all to just quickly say hi and who they are. And then I'll tell you a little bit about um, how this evening is going to work and we can launch into it. The, the main reason for getting you guys up to say hi now is just so that I can relax because I know your microphones are working. So, um, Hannah, do you want to just pop off mute and say hi quickly? <laughs> Um, hi everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Hannah. I'm an animal nurse. I've been an animal nurse for over five years in different settings in hospitals um, and experience of supporting families with rare dementia. And I also um, now work for Dementia UK directly on the helpline and the virtual clinics as well. Perfect. Thank you so much, Hannah. Um, Jules, do you want to unmute? Yeah. Hi, Vic. Very nice to be here this evening. I'm Jules Knight. I'm the consultant Admiral Nurse for Young Onset Dementia. Um, I've been Admiral Nursing for, I think it's 24 plus years in total. Um, again, like Hannah, in various different settings. And I've been working for Dementia UK, I think it's for about the last five years. But in my current role, uh, I think it's coming up a year in May. And I support our core services, our helplines, our helpline nurses, sorry, and our clinics nurses in their understanding and development around young onset dementia, and also have a national role around in, improving um, services and support for people and families living with young onset dementia. Thank you so much, Jules. And Lizzie, um, Lizzie's on the This Is Dementia um, icon, and I'm sure she'll tell us a little bit about that later. But can you unmute and say hi? Hi, uh, hi, thanks so much for having me. So my name's Lizzie Perry. I'm the founder of This Is Dementia, a social enterprise raising awareness of dementia, particularly uh, frontal temporal dementia and also young onset. And this enterprise was, fa um, was uh, founded because my dad also has frontal temporal dementia. So it was really inspired by our own uh, personal experience with dementia and uh, yeah, the uh, want to help more. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, thank you all again for, for joining us this evening. It's always such a relief when um, all of your guests can unmute and speak in the space because without you here this evening, it would just be me talking for a long time and, and that wouldn't be much fun. So that's great. Um, I'm just going to tell people who are listening to us live, um, you're more than welcome to ask us questions. We'd, we'd love you to come along and ask us a question. And we'll uh, towards the second half of this, the space, what I'll do is I'll open up the mics and you can, you can put your hand up and ask us a question by actually unmuting and, and joining us to talk or the other thing that you can do is you can actually send us um the, the question in and i will put a thing up very soon to tell you how to do that but essentially it's the little button that looks like a little um speech bubble down at the bottom and and as soon as i sort of set that up you'll be able to go in there and, and ask us a question that way and we will respond to those questions and the question can be to any of us or you can obviously direct it to a certain um, member of the speakers if, if you wish to do that um, as well. The other thing just to show you because I think it's a super cool feature and it's really lovely if people use this is the emoji feature. Um, when you're doing this and you're talking it's sometimes just nice to know that people are listening and that they're, 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 they're there and they're hearing what you're saying so it's quite nice for us as speakers if people occasionally hit an emoji or send us something so how you do that is the little heart with the plus sign um feel free to to hit that at any point and give us thumbs up or thumbs down or any other emojis actually don't give us thumbs up. no of course if you want to anything you want to do or you want to send that way please do um because it's just nice when you're a speaker to know that people are listening so i think that's all that I'm going to tell you, because we've got a lot we want to try and get through this evening and to be able to share with you. And I'm not um, initially between Hannah and Jules, we've got so much expertise. So I really don't mind 
who wants to answer these questions so um feel free to 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 just unmute yourself and, and answer the questions when you want to do that um but can we start off please by just actually discuss for a little bit what what actually is frontal temporal dementia what does it what does that term mean what's what's the what's the difference Hi, hi, Vic. It's Jules speaking, and Hannah. Please feel free to interject. I think we're, we're, we'll probably take it in turns, won't we, Hannah? Um, but essentially, frontotemporal dementia is an umbrella term for a group of dementias that affect the frontal and temporal lobes of the brain. So, if you want to know where they are, essentially, the frontal bit is the bit above your eyebrow. So, if you take the palm of your hand and lean your head, your forehead into your palms, that's your frontal lobe and your temporal lobes are just to the side of that to in between your ears and the front of your forehead if that makes sense just to give you an idea of where it is so our, our frontal and our temporal lobes of our brain are responsible for our personality our behavior our language and our speech so with frontal to temporal dementia memory loss and concentration problems are likely to be less common and you're more likely to see the changes in personality, behaviour, language and speech. Thank you. I love that. And actually, when you were talking through how to do it, I was doing that myself. So I'm sure there's... <laughs> so was I. <laughs> I'm sure there's other people as well who, who were doing that as well. Um, so in terms of... The numbers of people who um, this this is going to impact on, do or you know who are going to be diagnosed with with this, do we actually have any statistics around that? Because I know when I was looking prior to this conversation, I, I could find some, but they probably seemed quite old. They they seemed to be some some stats from from probably about two thousand and eleven, and and just in terms of the prevalence, do we do we have any figures around that? <laughs> Well, in terms of the numbers of people diagnosed, we think it's about one in 20 people. So it's quite a rare form of dementia. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, Hannah, sorry, were you going to add something then? I think, sorry, I was stopping there because I thought <laughs> Hannah was going to say something. Yeah, no, no, I was listening to it. Yeah, okay. I read it, that, that number, because it? it's a rare dementia and the number of people, it's really hard to get that statistic. And I suppose um, how to get numbers of people living with the condition and who have gone forward to get that diagnosis and I think it's equally common in men and women mm -hmm. um, and the, the risk of developing a frontal temporal dementia is one in 750 so it's not as rare as people think mm -hmm. um, but often recognizing those symptoms because like you say it's not always a memory loss or concentration problems are the early signs. And I think we struggle with figures because um, because this type of dementia tends to affect younger people we know that GPs don't actually record or have to record young onset dementia. So the statistics that we have for young onset dementia, um, we feel aren't accurate. They're probably an underestimate in terms of the whole numbers of people living with young onset dementia. So it's probably really difficult for us to say exactly how many people would have um, FTD in the UK. And I think we're, I know we're, I want to come on to diagnosis later because I, I know exactly what you're talking there about how, how it can be hard to get that diagnosis and challenging and, and I was really interested in what you were saying about it affecting equally men and women and so is that there's not any kind of evidence that to my understanding that certain groups of people are more likely to develop this is that is that correct? Um, we, we don't have any evidence that there's any particular um, group or ethnicity, for example, of people that's going to be affected. But we do know that there is um, a genetic component to some forms of FTD. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Let, let us know something about that. So in terms of a genetic component, does that, I would assume then that that's something that we, we you know, is obviously going to be of interest to people listening because we're, we're always keen to know about genetics and, and actually mm -hmm. if it, this is something that could be in her, her, hereditary. Um, are you able to say any more about that, either of you? Um, yeah, I suppose there's a, there's a high a risk of FTD being genetic. About a third of people 
who have um, FTD is triggered by a genetic problem, but it's a very unique problem to a family. So we always recommend about speaking to the consultant who's diagnosed and getting that family history um, because there is a link. But we're still trying to find out so much more about FTD. There's so much to learn why people develop. Some people develop, some people don't. Um, but if there is a genetic link to FTD, but we always say, it's an individual case and always going to the consultant or the GP to have those conversations. So is that one of the things when they test for familial dementia, they would test um, for FP- FTD as well? Yes, yeah, yeah they would yeah, they'd have to, yeah, to have that conversation with the specialist to see if there is that genetic mm-hmm. link and um, actually that support um, because they can cause a lot of fear with genetic risks and people often um, compare one family to the other so it's really important to have that individual yeah. SMS assessment for the risk factors yeah. living in the family. Makes sense. And, and Jules you mentioned um, age as well earlier on and and about the you know how how much more common this is in in younger people and and, and can you say a little bit more about why it, if you're younger if you're and by the way when we're talking about people who, younger people we're talking about people who are under the age of 65 so why is diagnosis harder for this group of people I mean, with with FTD, um, the average age of onset, if I remember, and Hannah, please correct me, but it's in your in your fifties and sixties. But actually, people can develop it in their you know sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties. But we also see much younger people um, developing it as well. The reason why it's so challenging for younger people to get a diagnosis is because I think primary care workers, so your GP, for instance, they're really not expecting. A younger person to have dementia mm. it's much rarer for a younger person to have dementia and typically I think and generally in the population when we think about dementia we often think about memory problems that's the first symptom that springs to mind so with FTD the first symptom usually isn't memory or concentration problems um, it, we're looking at as I mentioned earlier changes in personality changes in behaviour, changes in language and changes in speech. And often these changes, particularly um, in the very early um, days of the the, um, disease progression, can be very subtle and very difficult to pick up. And actually it's quite interesting with young onset dementia is often it can be work colleagues that notice these issues. Um, you know, if you think about our, our, you know, work environment, working full time, Monday to Friday, nine to five, you know, we often spend a huge amount of time with our work colleagues and actually they can pick up these changes. They notice that work is changing or that, you know, somebody's personality has changed. They might be um, from being very outward going. They may, may be more reserved. They may seem cold. They may seem distant. They may notice changes, as I said, in their language, in their speech, in their ability to kind of produce work. So it may be work colleagues that notice issues first and um, within the work environment. There may be issues around um, competency with regard to work. Um, often we find people um, in terms of work um, may be um, facing disciplinary, for example, because they're not being able to do the work that they used to do. And this may then trigger a referral to occupational health within work. And then from occupational health, it may trigger a referral through the GP to neurology. So a bit convoluted. Sometimes it is the family that picks up on these things if there's if there are changes. But as I said, they can be quite subtle to start with. Um, people then go to their GP. And because of the age range, the average age range, sort of 50s and 60s, often GPs will associate this with change of life, midlife crisis. Think that the person may have depression, potentially treat for depression. And actually that delays the person being referred on to specialist services. Really important that the GP rules out any physical health causes initially, Um, you know, usual blood tests just to check that there aren't any issues with things like vitamin deficiencies, infections, thyroid problems, etc. And then actually treat those if necessary If there is a depression there, treat that. But then also it's really important to go back to the GP. So if issues are continuing, 
to ensure that they they go back to the GP and ask for referral on to um, neurology services. But again, it can be really difficult because the person living with FTD, I know not necessarily diagnosed as yet, but they may not be aware of the symptoms that they have and the challenges that the family are facing in, in supporting them. So it can often be really difficult encouraging that person to make contact with the GP and the GP you know, often acts as the gateway to services that can support them and their family as well. So it can be really, really challenging and that's why it can take such a long time for someone to get a diagnosis. I think to sort of add to that is that the, the delay in that diagnosis, the impact on the family when that person lacks that insight to anything that's wrong, especially if it's the behavioural variant and um, they often miss the opportunity to access that support and the person has advanced, um, and especially like Jules said, when that person lacks that insight, it's hard to even get them to the GP, so that can be difficult sometimes for families. Thank, thanks, ladies. I, I don't know if you possibly noticed or not, but my signal went down, so I don't know if you noticed that at that point. Um, I think I might have appeared that I was still here, so I, I really apologise. Um, I think we were still talking about um, diagnosis at that point, is that right? Yes, yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah. Fantastic. It only went down for a second, but it's very scary when it goes down. But I'm glad that you didn't notice. So I, when I came back in, it, it sounded, Hannah, as if you were just talking a little bit about the different variants. Um, is that is that correct? And would you be able to tell us a little bit more about that, please? Yeah, definitely. I suppose with um, FTD, it's sort of an umbrella term and you do get different types. So as you all said, the symptoms at the frontal part of your brain and that's the executive function um, and it affects personality, behaviour, language and speech. But FTD is, is, is actually broken into two different variants. So you get the behavioural variant, which affects someone's behaviour. So it could be as simple as reduced mobility motivation, lack of interest in things, apathy is a big symptom as well, that lack of emotion about human things and activity. Um, it can be obsessions, people can become obsessed with um, alcohol, shopping, spending money. Um, it could be things from um, even during jigsaw, there can be obs obsession and also craving of a more carbohydrate or foods and eating become, maybe becomes more of a obsession and overeating and over drinking as well sometimes of alcohol issues because of that obsession so the, there's the behavior variant um, and I tend to lack that insight into anything that's wrong um, and just lack of awareness of changes in themselves um, and sometimes it's like difficult with planning as well their personality is changing they might be as Jill said at work able to do jobs but as the behavioral variant the planning Social, social ambitions as well, so may a lack awareness of appropriate things to say or change and speak and also that aspect. But then you do get the language variant. So with Bruce Willis, it's very much about his language, aphrasia, and, and that's known as um, the behavioural variant. And then you get the language variant, which is primary progressive aphrasia, which is PPA. And that, that again, breaks down into different conditions and that affects language rather than behaviour. So you get semantic dementia, for example, is difficult remembering what words are. So you might say to someone with semantic dementia, can you pass me the kettle? But they may have lost that semantic memory to remember what a kettle is. Um, and generally their vocabulary can be affected. But then you also get a progressive non-fluent aphrasia, which is difficulty with speech. And about forming sentences become different grammar becomes different in their language um, and also that can be uh, hesitation as well using shorter sentences and using the wrong word and then there's another type as well which is leukopenic variant which is has the Alzheimer's pathology so it's a language variant of young onset Alzheimer's disease and that's difficult with finding words stopping when they're speaking sounds like they've got the word at the end of the tongue but just can't get it out um, and often with that type of dementia, um, it's unlikely that they forget the meaning of the word. They just can't, difficult finding the right word to say. Um, and that can be quite difficult to witness someone with these language variants because language is such an important part of who we are, how we express ourselves, how we follow instructions. It's not maybe not even always about speaking. It can be affect writing as well um, and how you um, 
process if something's a question how do you respond to that am i supposed to respond how do you put that sentence together how do you express your emotion so the language event affects so many things and um and it's great that Bruce Willis has raised awareness of the language variant of these conditions um in the spotlight oh thank you it, it's so interesting hearing because you get a full sense of actually how how different this type of dementia is and actually how many different variants there is and actually i think that helps to illustrate why it can be challenging as well for a GP to recognise these symptoms and for the family and, and the person themselves to recognise these symptoms because the, they, they, there's so much variation, isn't there? There's so much, um, you know, different different things that you might see and, and, and you can completely get um, a, a quite a good picture of why this might be quite challenging to, to see and recognise um, in somebody. So I was just thinking, you mentioned, um, obviously, Bruce Willis and, and his recent diagnosis, and, and, and that's obviously what's prompted us to, to do this space. When we, would, we would have probably actually done it anyway, but, you know, it kind of it, it led us to think, let's do this now, because obviously we know there's all these questions going around about it. And I'm, I'm just thinking about Bruce Willis, and I'm going to come to you very shortly, Lizzie. Um, but I was just thinking, we know that Bruce has got a large blended family, he's got young children, um, and we also know that people are likely to be younger when when they get this when they get this diagnosis so therefore more likely to actually have um, a young family and in terms of resources for children what do we and, and younger carers what's what's around what do we know and, and Lizzie you might even want to pop in after this bit but I'll, I'll start with you, you Jules and Hannah and then um, see what Lizzie's got to tell us about what she found because I'm sure she'll have something to to add. I think what you're saying there, Vicky, it's really important. I mean, you know, Hannah, Hannah described the symptoms and as you said, they're so variable. It's really important that children understand what's happening with their parent, understand the changes. You know, if you've had a really loving parent whose personality changes and they're quite distant from you, obviously that's going to have a huge emotional impact. And we really need to take that into account. We need to think about how we can support those children and you know we're talking about children from zero to you know 18 so we, we need to cover all spectrums really but in terms of accessing support um, we have young carers organizations across the UK and young carers obviously they it's a, a, every carer comes from a different background it's not necessarily dementia but actually being able to access the young carers um, services me, that they get time away from their care Care. Oh, did you hear that, or was that just me? Was it? okay. I'll carry on. Sorry. So, for young carers, it's really important they get time away from from home, so they can be children and enjoy themselves with other children, but also getting some psychological and emotional support at the same time. So, we'd always recommend where possible that children do connect with young carers organisations. Often, children don't see themselves as carers when they're supporting a parent with dementia. I think when we tend to think of a carer, we think of practical things. And often the children um, of people with dementia aren't doing practical things, but it's supporting their emotional health that's important. Um, we've got some, um, some sites that we can actually share on Twitter, Vic. Um, the Children Society, um, a really good national charity that has some really fantastic advice for professionals and for families around supporting young carers. Really important that we um, let the school know. So if the child is in school, that we let their teachers know, their main teacher know that they're a carer so that they can make and um, make, well support them really and as for an example, it might be that they can have their mobile phone with them in their bag um, in class because they need to know that their parents are safe, um, that they're being cared for, that they can keep connected with, the par with, with their parent, if you like. So let the school know. Um, the schools should be able to support the child in accessing counselling um, and um, counselling support services within the school. And certainly when it comes to um, exams, it would again be letting the examinations board know that the child is in a caring role and actually it might be quite difficult for them. They may be allowed more time in exams. They may be, um, in terms of grading, they may be supported with their grading, for example. 
So I'd always encourage families to link in with schools to, to, to really engage that they're fully aware of what's happening. Again, for a young child, um, having a parent with young onset dementia, it may be very isolating for them. They may at times be quite embarrassed by the parent's behaviour, for example. So it's it's really important that they get that emotional support at that time so they can feel confident in speaking to their teachers, perhaps sharing with a friend as well. Um, Hannah, I don't know if you have anything to add there. I don't think I've missed anything out. I think you've covered most of it. I think you really highlighted when it's the behavioural variant and the behaviours um, make that family or that child feel like their parent is standing out and mm. different. That can be really yeah. difficult and it might, it's also about educating their friends about their condition, if they feel comfortable to share that, um, to recognise it's the disease and not their dad as well. Mm. Because that can yeah. be a lot of sense of loss that one of a family can feel and also like a younger family, not having that relationship with that parent without that dementia, not knowing who their parent is. So even more so accessing support, counselling, everything that Jules mentioned, it's really important. Fantastic, ladies. Thank you so much. And I think, Lizzie, um, it's it'd be great to come to you now because obviously you, you've you been in this situation we've just been talking about and, and your dad's um, diagnosis of dementia and, and actually being that that a child and I know you're you're not young <laughs> you are you're, you're young <laughs> I'll <okay>. take it <laughs> okay <laughs> um but how how has it been for you um what's your experience been like um in terms of dad's diagnosis I think um everything that's been said so far it's really resonated with me um and especially with with it being young onset as well for dad and frontal temporal together we noticed um changes with dad probably a year before he was formally diagnosed and these symptoms are quite as you said subtle to begin with um things like staring at people um having communication difficulties lacking focus or being unable to complete tasks and also not doing tasks at there that he used to be able to do really well and be like the go-to person for um, like technology um, that then had a, a knock-on effect to those sort of things so then after um, after a year he was formally diagnosed from yeah so the in terms of the changes and the initial changes with dad it came from those four main things I'd say for me. And in terms of the the changes, can can you remember? Was Dad himself aware that that, that these changes? I think uh, Dad originally put a lot of these down to stress, and I think that was also mentioned earlier as well. So he was working full time, and um, a lot of these symptoms could be down to burnout or stress or anything else that could be going on with your life. And it's already been mentioned that you know you wouldn't assume automatically it was it was dementia. Um, but we did have a moment on a family holiday where there was a situation and he was, um, I think, a bit confused. And, and I got back to where we were staying. And I was crying and then he looked at me and he was crying and we both had a, a big hug. And I'll always remember that. And I think in my mind, he knew then that something was was going on more so than just stress. Those kind of little moments of, of insight. Yeah. How old was at this point if, and, and do you mind asking as asking how old you yeah were at that well? time I was 24 and dad was I think he was a 56 57 and when he was formally diagnosed mm. I think he was 57 58 it was all around his mid mid 50s so very very young yeah and, and was that assumably yes oh sorry I, I didn't hear that question oh so my sound is <laughs> terrible I'm having apologies tonight um but dad was still working at the point that he he started to, to to develop these symptoms yeah he was he retired early just before the diagnosis so he was diagnosed post-retirement but we were noticing these changes whilst he was still working um and then as soon as he got the diagnosis he had quite a rapid decline in his um in his symptoms and his condition so I'd, I'd like to ask you a few questions, if I can, about getting that diagnosis for yeah. that. And, and I, I just want to remind people who are listening, if you're listening to The Space Live and, and you want to ask a question, um, do remember you can do that. Um, you can either so put your hand up um, and, and come and ask us a question directly or you can type a question in the in the chat box and we'll, we'll come to you so sorry for interrupting your, your session there Lizzie but I just wanted to remind everybody that they can do that 
So in terms of getting this diagnosis for, for dad, what was it actually like? Um, was dad quite happy to, to go along and, and seek a diagnosis? Um, so from what I understand, dad's diagnosis came about through something completely different. Um, he had a collapse in the gym. Um, and they thought at the time he'd had a heart attack. So then he was taken to hospital and they did scans and they did a brain scan. And from that scan, they saw that there was um, changes in the size of his brain. And that then trickled on to him eventually getting a formal diagnosis. So it wasn't, um, as far as I'm aware, it wasn't a, a direct diagnosis from from that thought path. It was through this um, this incident at the gym. And do you know sort of how long that that all took for? And did you, was it sort of quite quite swift or was it quite long? It roughly do, do took remember? twelve months to get the diagnosis. It was quite um, yeah, twelve months. Yeah, and um, it's it, it's one of those things where you know the, the how long it takes to get a diagnosis can can vary so much um you know depending on where you live in the uk what symptoms you present with the you know the, the services that are around in that area and, and we know that it, it can take a, a, a period of time and actually while you're waiting for that diagnosis that can be quite difficult as well because you're kind of in limbo aren't you yeah. you're not quite sure exactly what's what's going to go so once um do you do you remember what impact it actually had once you received the diagnosis yeah. or, at, at all um, I remember yeah. the day that we found out and I was in the middle of a work meeting and was finding out he was diagnosed and at first it was this initial relief that there was a diagnosis because you know typically that would mean there's a cure or there's a treatment plan or there's something we can do um but with the, with his dementia, there, there isn't a cure and, and there isn't any treatments. Um, my dad's only taking vitamins for his dementia. So there really isn't anything medical that we can do. So I think once that reality set in and, and I understood the like the complications from this, I really struggled. Um, and being 24 at the time, I was working in London. I wasn't at home and I couldn't relate to any of my friends. So it was a really um, a challenging mental health time for me. But luckily, the company I was working with, we were super good and they got counselling for me, which in the end wasn't mm-hmm. actually that beneficial because I didn't understand what I was going to counselling for. I, I knew I was upset and I knew I was dealing with something, but it wasn't it wasn't clear to me the path I needed. And hindsight, it was kind of a grief counselling that I needed at the time. Um, so I went to the doctors as well to try and get a form of counselling through them. And they did recommend me to a few groups, but they were limited to, do I have dementia myself or am I taking my dad who has the dementia? And as I was living in London, you know, I couldn't do either of those things. So I ended up bizarrely going to what I thought was a support group. And it turned out to be the Greenwich Council Dementia Action Group meeting. Um, and there were minutes taken and there were um, guest speakers. And I'd gone there fully ready to be emotional <laughs> and talk about all mm-hmm. my things. Um, so I really struggled, actually, to get the support that I needed at the time. Um, the Dementia Action Group in Greenwich were great. I met lots of lovely people. But in terms of the, the day-to-day support group, um, yeah, that was, a, that was a big struggle. And it was touched on earlier about isolation for children. Um, and that can definitely go on into adulthood as well. Um, my friends... And they just couldn't relate as much as they wanted to be there. And I think sometimes, you know, we we talk about the fact that a diagnosis of dementia affects the whole family and the whole family lives with that diagnosis. And and yet, actually, sometimes as as, as parents, we want to protect our children. We want to shield them. We want to to not give them all the information. So I I, and obviously I know you you can't speak for mum and how she felt in terms of this, but. It, it, I can imagine as a mum, it would have probably been quite hard to, for her to even know what to tell you and, yeah, and how exactly. to have that. And, and she's going yeah. through her own her own um, situation. It's her husband um, and it's my dad and same for my nanny. It's her son. Everyone's going through it from a different lens. Um, and things that mm-hmm. I will be emotional about are, are separate, like, you know, things that dad will miss out on, such as, you know, weddings or things I'll miss out on, like, helping me with DIY or like silly things like that that you'd go to your dad for that hasn't been the yeah. case for me and that was a big challenging thing to get by um and that's completely different to yeah someone else's perspective in the family 
Yeah, completely. And it does, it, you know, I love what you said there about people looking at things through different lenses, because that's what we do, isn't it, as humans anyway? We, we, we can't help that. We look at every different situation differently based on our own, um, you know, our, our own lenses and, and our own experiences and perceptions of the situation. But, but they will be different because of your previous relationship and the expectations of that relationship as well. Yeah. So, can imagine it's it's very very difficult so in terms of support we know obviously i shared about the story about the, the group in greenwich mm -hmm. but and, and often what we hear at dementia uk is families saying that they some families saying they've had not really much in the way of support that they've been given the diagnosis and off you go and you, you know you're not necessarily given much support at all and other people saying I was given some some leaflets, some documents. I was given access to this service, and and if you compare it to things like if you receive a cancer diagnosis, what support might kick in? We know that in in terms of dementia services, often the support isn't quite as um, all encompassing as it might be if you had another type of diagnosis. But do you what sort of support do you do you remember what support mum was offered or you were offered as a family? Yeah, I mean like you hit the nail on the head there. You you get given all these leaflets and all this uh uh support I guess from from healthcare, you know, this is all the information. But the biggest support that, that my mom had was the Admiral Nurse. Um our Admiral Nurse Tracy was an incredible um incredible help and support for my mom and, and genuinely got my mom through I would say this diagnosis and, and to where my mom is now um, she's Tracy is still a, a key support for her um, and an amazing mm. person to to talk to um, so I think out of all of the noise that you get after a diagnosis it really was the Admiral Nurses that pulled us through. I mean and obviously that's fantastic stories yeah. to hear and my and Hannah and everybody listening we're, we're going to love that and, and I guess just to let if, if you're listening to this today and you, you don't have an admiral nurse and you don't know what an admiral nurse is I'll just let you know that admiral nurses were, were dementia specialist nurses were um, supported and developed by the charity Dementia UK and obviously this is the Dementia UK's um, monthly or twice monthly in this case um, Twitter spaces that, that we run to, to sort of provide that education and support to people if you live in an area where you have an admiral nurse, you might be able to access one. And um, Lizzie was just talking now about Tracy and, and a local nurse who was able to provide some support to Lizzie and her family face to face. Um, I'm, I'm assuming face to face, and then parts not during COVID, <laughs> but you know, provide that support. But the other thing that we do have wherever you are is our helpline services, our core clinical services at Dementia UK. And how we provide support that way, if you want to speak to a nurse, is either if it, if it's something that you wouldn't speak to a nurse within sort of the next couple of days, quite urgently about, you can phone our helpline, um, and we'll I'll put the details up around that into the nest so you can find those, and or you can also go onto our website and book a clinical appointment for a nurse at a time that suits you, um, and book an appointment that way. So we've got two ways. That you can you can speak to one of our nurses and get some support and advice. Of course, the other way you can speak to one of our nurses right now is just ask us a question because we're here and um, you've got three of us here this evening for the, for the next twenty minutes. So do feel free to um, ask us any questions that you might have this evening, and and we'll do our best to to answer those for you. So, Lizzie, I've got another question for you, please. So, can I ask you? In terms of dad's dad's diagnosis, um, with any diagnosis, actually, whenever you get receive a diagnosis of dementia, you're going to, as a family, have things that you know happen that you things that you know that challenges that you face or ways that you've got to adapt and change as a family um, over the course of that. And it, I'm just wondering if there's anything that you'd be able to share with us any experiences of things that have happened and actually how you've adapted or, or, or responded to them as a family? Yeah, I think, um, I think with dad's diagnosis, as I mentioned to you, he deteriorated quite quickly after, after receiving it. And the biggest challenge for us was his staring. Um, so for me, my background is a product developer. So my initial thought was how can I produce something that he can wear um sorry product developer for fashion should I say um that he can wear that can visually let people know what's going on uh because pairing his um staring issues with uh, his in inability to speak he really lost the ability to use his verbal 
communication. So we'd have instances where he could be staring at someone and, and they could get aggressive. And we've had that in the past. And, and dad couldn't, couldn't reply or couldn't defend himself verbally with, with what was going on. So for us, it was what visual things can we do to try and help this situation? So we made him a t-shirt, which said loud and big on the front, sorry for staring, it's just my dementia, which is very individual to dad and dad would probably wear anything I'd give him. Um, but he wore this and we saw such a great um, change from people's perspectives and how they reacted to him and, and helped out my mom afterwards, rather than shying away, they would reach out. Um, so along with those sort of visual prompts, we had cards that we would give to restaurants. He wears the sunflower lanyard, or he used to when he was going outside. He'd wear the lanyard. So just really vis visual things that we could do to help dad, you know, get across what was going on for him without him being able to was uh, one way that we adapted. Um, and then also my mom retired early and, and she was caring for him full time before we then got um, some help from home instead and then we were on to other carers now so it was really that um, external support system as well okay. and I, I love the 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 idea of, of you know the, the t-shirts and actually you. you've done so much actually you're, you're being very modest because I know that dad's diagnosis from the the other stuff that you've gone on and done and you know your vicious dementia and and the other way you've done you I think it's fair to say that actually dad's diagnosis of dementia probably had a massive impact on on you and some of the stuff you decided to do could you tell us a little bit about that yeah of course so after seeing the the positive impact of dad's initial t-shirt we then thought about how how if this is helping our family, how can we do something that could potentially help other families going through similar situations? So we um, created six different designs that were dementia related and less specific towards staring. Um, and then we were selling those T-shirts and, and donating all of the money to Dementia UK. So a way of, of helping families kind of visually get across uh, awareness about dementia, but then also giving back to, in essence, Admiral nurses who have really been our key support. And you've been involved in providing education and I think you've got an Instagram account. Oh, as well, yeah, absolutely. You? So, yeah, our main um, our main presence is on Instagram. It's this is Dementia UK. Um, and in between doing our T-shirts and, and our products, we also provide information on dementia and in a more, um, I guess, approachable way for people in their, their teens and their 20s, like people like me, basically, who at the time struggled to get that support. If I could have a, an online presence and I could find someone going through something similar and have bullet points of what could be going on, um, that would be great. So this month that we're doing a focus um, on frontal temporal dementia, um, this actually wasn't to do with Bruce Willis. It's my dad's birthday today. So we were doing a focus in February on his dementia. And um, it's a really great platform. And, and I get a lot of people messaging uh, in similar situations and we've met up for support and I talk to them quite a lot. So it's formed kind of an online community of, of the children of people going through young onset dementia, which is lovely. And that's so important because, do you know, one of the things that I think is amazing is that, you, you know, this diagnosis has, has really propelled you to do something that's going to make a difference I can without doubt say it's going to make a difference to to young people who are experiencing a parent living with dementia and, and we know like we've said earlier that the resources aren't necessarily easy to find they might not be very attractive to children um, nobody wants to read long documents <laughs> and of course if you're young I mean actually probably so many people do but you know, <laughs> look People might not want to read them. So actually, how do you make something that's accessible and, and kind of quite quite cool, actually? And, you know, and I, I've certainly have seen the products you, you've you created and I, I think they're, they're, they're desirable products. Yeah. <laughs> they're cool yeah, thank you. They're not, they're not, that look like something that's, you know, potentially a, a dementia product or what, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just that. I think that they're, was the, the thing. It was making a product that was visually attractive to people. You'd wear in the pub or you'd wear to the gym, you'd wear out anywhere really and all whilst doing that you're raising awareness of a really important a really important cause um, a friend of mine Jay Scott he was the designer for all of our designs um, and he's really yeah he's amazing with these designs and listened to the kind of inspiration that we had for them such as the clock t-shirt is a, a reference to the clock test that you have during diagnosis the sun still shines in muddled minds is a really lovely one that he came up with and it's just putting a positive 
well, not spin, but a positive aspect towards it. So it's not all doom and gloom. And we can raise awareness and, and wear something really nice um, and spread joy whilst doing it. Um, and then for yeah. the Instagram, it's just what can people, like, I don't know the, the stats, but I reckon people spend so much time on Instagram. What can we put out there that young people can quickly just reference? They can save it on their phones um, or they can just message me and have that one-to-one support from myself um, if they feel like they're, they're a bit alone in it. I think it's it, it's so important, isn't it? Yeah. That you all, all of what you're doing, it's Thank it's you. just so important. Actually, you you know, people because we, we, with all types of dementia, there's no cure. There's no there, there isn't a cure that's available. Sometimes medication might be prescribed. Sometimes it might not, and that's actually with any type of dementia. So it's how do you positively manage and live with this diagnosis? And and actually, I think what you've done is taken this diagnosis and actually really put maybe it is a positive spin you've put you've taken the positivity and you've gone okay let's create something that's going to help yeah so um yeah. you know complete, complete hats off to Thank you with you. that I'm gonna, I'm gonna um come to Hannah and Jules again if, if I can and just because what I was just saying there about that there being no cure and and Lizzie I'd like you to to jump in and out of this as well as, as you as you like because of that actually how do people what what tips might you be able to give um in terms of helping somebody to to manage this diagnosis actually what um what sort of practical strategies might you be able to share or or you know what advice would we give to people listening who who might be struggling to manage with this diagnosis and i say any of you can answer that i guess i I would always say to, to families that I'm supporting is is just remember that um, the behaviour that you're seeing um, or the changes in personality that you're seeing, for example, um, it's not intentional because often people say, well, he's doing that on purpose or she's doing that on purpose and she's making me um, she's making me feel mad, you know, mad or guilty. I've, and and it's about reminding the families it's, it, this isn't happening because the person's doing it on purpose it's because of the changes to their brain always important to try and stay calm even in the most difficult of situations um supporting the 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 person um by remaining calm hopefully helps them feel less stressed um and if you can support them at the way in that way then the people around them won't get stressed so it's trying to kind of reduce those stresses um I guess, you know, what Lizzie has said with regards to the T-shirt, absolutely amazing idea. It just lets people know that there's an issue and what the issue, you know, is. And and as you say, you know, Lizzie, your mum had a really good response in terms of getting support. Um, I think Lizzie also mentioned um, the hidden disabilities sunflower lanyard that you can get and people can wear. And it just highlights that somebody might have issues that um, need some additional support and I think those lanyards are being more and more recognised actually which is really really helpful. Other families um, that I've worked with they've actually carried like a little credit card size piece of paper or cardboard and written something on there like my husband has dementia um, and um, on the other side, I'm sorry <laughs> if, I'm, if, if it's difficult. And they found that really helpful. So I think it goes back to kind of looking at the individual situation. Um, I guess other things for the family that can really help is, is, is getting support. So you've obviously mentioned our helpline, our core services, but also um, getting support from other families who are going through a similar situation. I don't know about you, Hannah, but I think um, often families will say to me that's 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 one of the most supportive avenues for them because the families that they they're connecting with re- are really going through similar situations, mm-hmm. and they can share and can share that with each other actually. Yeah, especially when it's not it's a rarer type of dementia. It's not memory problem led. It's the behaviour. It's the language and that peer to peer support. And often people carers can share their strategies as well with Mm. other carers and feel um, empowered and not so isolated um, because yeah of the condition and and things like if it is 
the language variant about access to speech and language there. Mm. I know it's not always commissioned in areas, but I know there is, like UCL do um, PPA, information support, um, research on that aspect as well. So speech and language therapy can be beneficial in the early stages, looking at devices and that can help someone to communicate and lower that anxiety. Um, but yeah, because it is a hidden di- uh, disability, you don't see it. It's about educating people friends around you about what FTD is, why that that change uh, in someone and identifying the disease, not the person and then dignity, I think is really important. And looking at the if there are obsessions such as alcohol, it's about how you manage that by using non alcoholic uh, wine and things like that to look at what the obsession is and how you can monitor it um, safely. Yeah, and in terms of if, if somebody, um, you know, has a food obsession, you can think, you know, there's advice that you can get around um, managing meal times, um, portion control, thinking about um, healthy food options, making those available. Um, um, oh, gosh, what else? And also sometimes people like clapping. It's sometimes, mm. you know, clapping can be, it's okay for you, the person they're clapping for a short period of time but when you're with that person all day and they, they want to clap it's about maybe having them something to hold wearing like gloves to stop that sound um, and, and just to prevent that happening um, and awareness as well and like Jill said food the craving of hard, sort of carbohydrates sweet food um, it's like locking away those sort of food and rationing them more mm. um, so you're not stopping someone having those treats but you're just um, monitoring the obsession and the behaviour um, in a more controlled environment. And I guess the other thing as well, I'm just thinking, is that with any type of dementia that somebody might have, we know that there's certain things that you might want to think about that, you know, might 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 trigger somebody to, to have a certain type of behaviour. So things like noisy places, lots of people talking over each other, changes in routine, um, pain and the management of pain, inability to communicate and say what you might want to say and, and do. and And even sometimes... With the best will in the world and the best intention, carers and families kind of wrap people up in cotton, don't they? And they want to protect them and they stop doing things. But that can lead to boredom and activity, inactivity for people. And so I, I guess it's some of those things that we would suggest and, and advocate that you, you you allow someone to maintain as much as possible and, and, and just be mindful of the environment and the impact that's having. That's going to be no different, I would imagine, isn't it? That's, mm the stuff that you just want to to think about and and I really liked what you you, you both kind of well, in fact all of you have said is around seeing the person and what's important to them and and what they want to do and you know and because we all want to do different things don't we and like doing different things so so how do you maintain the the positives and the things they can do rather than perhaps focus on obviously tonight we spoke about the things that might go and the, the challenges you might have but how do you maintain those those positives for somebody Lizzie was there or anybody else anything else you wanted to add in terms of some of the ways that you you might find it helpful to, to manage and cope with this type of dementia um I think just for, for my final points I guess it's just the the reminder for me always that like, dad is still dad you know he I am um, I don't remember the last time we had a conversation, but when he looks at me, I know, I, I know he knows me and his, he, he understands the presence of me being there and he's happy. So for me, it's just the relationship has just shifted um, and just always reminding myself, you know, that that's the most important thing. Dad's happy, he's healthy and, you know, he's here. Um, and how I can spend my time with him, it might be different from before, but it's still time that I'm spending with my dad and that's such a blessing. So I just always remind myself of that. And if I'm getting sad or whatever, it's it's such a lovely thing that I'm able to spend the time with him. And things like the things he used to love, just to end on this bit, football, for instance. Dad was a huge fan, he still is, football fan. So my brother is always reminding my mom that football's on the TV, we need to put it on. My mom now spends her mm-hmm. Sundays watching match of the day, whatever it is that's on. Um, and also the team that dad supported, it was Birmingham City. Um, they, they allowed us to come and, and use one of their boxes so dad could watch it from the safety of a box, but still be included in the, um, yeah, in the whole thing, which was lovely. Mm-hmm. 
that's amazing and that's a great example of how you you found something that that dad's always enjoyed that you know that is giving him pleasure that he's still able to engage and enjoy and 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 you know and actually you know mum's mum's doing that you know she's watching <laughs> yeah. the day. Yeah. and i guess you know with with um things like sky sports and you know you could you can have football on pretty much all the time can't you yeah i think that's my mom's <laughs> no. annoyance <laughs> it is on all the time <laughs> But, but that's providing dad with meaning and purpose and something he, yeah. he wants yeah, to do. Yeah, and it's do. lovely. And we can watch the games yeah. with him and, you know, it's it's lovely. Yeah, and it's so important. And actually, whatever it is that you, the person that you're look, you're living with or you're looking after, whether it's a family member or whoever, it's we're all different. So for me, I, I, I'm I sorry to say it, football would probably drive me completely I wouldn't enjoy it. I don't enjoy football that much. So that wouldn't be my happy place. But we've all got our happy places, haven't we? And, you know, and actually working out and thinking, what is it? And can that person still engage with that? And I, I love the fact that they were able to provide you with a box as well. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. Just... Yeah, it was really nice of them. Really, really good. And and it is so important that we maintain those things and, and, and fantastic that dad is able to go. Is he still able to go to the grounds now? No, no, sadly not. He's uh, he's pretty much bed bound for the last year. Um, mm. But before that, it was, um, I think a couple of years ago now, he was able to go and do those. So now it's it's all the fun things that we can do from his room, you know, the um, the films and the football on TV and, and sitting with him and stuff. And we've just got an, a small puppy. So he's besotted with dad and mm -hmm. the animals have such a great way of of being with people. So, yeah, he has a lot of enjoyment from that. You know, animals are great. And I think partly the reason animals are great is because they don't ask questions. They don't challenge. They just give exactly. Love and yeah. Them completely <laughs> yeah so fantastic and i'm gonna come to hannah and jules for some some final thoughts and i know jules you've really kindly popped some resources as well in a down for people i tried to share them up there as well so people should be able to see some of those resources feel free to mention any of those as well jules or you know, any final thoughts from you i think just i mean it, it really is kind of echoing what lucy just said actually you know, if you're living as a family with young onset dementia, with with um, the rare dementia, frontotemporal dementia, reach out into your community, find out what is out there that can support you. It may not be a service that's particularly for younger people, but actually by reaching out into the community and finding out what's out there, you'll be su really surprised at what comes back and what can support you as a family. Um, loving what Lizzie said about the football. <laughs> I think that's absolutely fantastic. And it just gives you an idea of what can actually be resourced if, if, if you try. So that would be uh, my top tip. And I guess the other thing would be come to the helpline if you need support. Don't ever feel that you're alone with this. Um, I've put some information up. Some of it um, is very relevant in terms of the children's societies. As I said earlier, some really good information um, for how to support children, for professionals and also for families. Um, and I've also put the Dementia UK um, web pages up on FTD as well. Fantastic, thank you. And anybody listening to this, is because obviously the, the space is recorded, and if you're listening to it later, you won't be able to see those links that we've shared there, but we'll, we'll try and, and tag them afterwards in, in the space so that you can find those links if you want to. And, and obviously I'm going to mention that we've also got information on the Dementia UK website that, that you can access there as well um, around that, and also links to to how to how to get support. Hannah, any final thoughts from yourself? I think it's the, the key is to reach out when you need that help um, and that support. And often people with a rare dementia do feel that isolation. And it's about reaching out when you need that support. And even, as Lizzie was saying, the more advanced stages of the disease, it's how you can still engage with the person with, through other senses, touch, smells, being there. Um, but it's, yeah, awareness of the support when you need it. Contact the helpline, the website for information. It's, it's so important. And, and don't be afraid to reach out and get support because I think people, there is still a fear at times, isn't there, and thinking... I, I don't want to admit that I need support or I need help, but but really don't ever feel that way. Just, you know, just reach out and, and have a conversation because 
you know it, it can really make the difference as Lizzie was saying that you know her admiral nurse had made a difference and and getting that support had, had helped her family so so do do feel that you can you can come back forward that way if you'd like to so we're, we've come right to the end of the hour um so just to thank everybody who's who's listen to us this evening um which you haven't had any questions live which is unusual but that's completely and utterly fine um it's, i hope you found the session helpful and and beneficial to you um we're, we're going to be here again at the later part of the month um uh, and that space will be going up and being advertised fairly soon so so do come and join us again hopefully and if so, if you are listening to this later on, um, on on Twitter, you you, you actually I've just realised you might be able to catch some of those resources if you look at the Spaces dashboard site. Um, I'm saying we'll try and put them up again as well on the on on linked to this this spread. So hopefully we'll be able to find those resources that that might be helpful. So that's it for us today. Um, thank you again to my speakers this evening. You've you've been amazing. And um, thank you, everybody, who's listened to us. And I will now um, very shortly end the space. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.